Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure for us to be here. I'm Charmaine Dean. I am the Vice President of Research International and Ventures Commercialization at the University of Waterloo. And we're really thrilled to be out here in Stratford today and really thrilled by your presence at our event tonight. Thank you so much to the Stratford community for coming out. We've been paying a lot of attention at the University of Waterloo to our indigenous culture and to truth and reconciliation and really focusing on what we need to do at, this, at our institution, at, at our campuses, to foster an inclusive community. So before we begin, I'd like to pay respects to the Atawandaran, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo sits on their territories. Much of our community, in fact, are individuals who reside on lands close to the University of Waterloo. So this land that we occupy is on the Haldeman Tract, and it's land that was granted to the Six Nations. It includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. I also acknowledge and recognize that this area is now home to many diverse First Nations communities, and the way we work and the values that we um, imbue into our training, the work that we do with our students, we try to make sure that they are respectful of the values that indigenous peoples bring to the community. So I'm really pleased to welcome you all here today. So we're really thrilled to be in Stratford. University research, our commercialization, the way we train students, it's all in, important to bring in community members. You know that the university was founded by business leaders and community leaders, not by simply a bunch of scholars. And so this is exactly what we do, making sure that we work with the community to understand what's important to you. And part of this is just coming out and telling you what we're doing. So this particular topic is about artificial intelligence, and I know where we've got our registrar in the office, Kathy Newell Kelly. Kathy, can you stand? And I know that she's going to want to ask all the sorts of questions about exams, et cetera, with the whole chat GPT thing. But we want to focus more broadly than chat GPT um, and talk about a whole variety of areas that AI is influencing society. And in areas where AI is influencing society positively. So the questions are, where is AI going to take us? And we've got a panel of speakers that will help us understand that. Before we begin, though, we've got a campus here in Stratford and an amazing leader who is helping our community in, in Stratford understand what's best to fit in. So we've got interactive art and design as part of the Stratford campus training facility. And Christine is here today, Christine McWebb. And I'd like to invite her to say a few words at the start, simply because she's doing such great work with the community in Stratford and making sure that our presence in Stratford aligns with the vision of the Stratford community. So, Christine. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for uh, coming here tonight. It's so wonderful to have a full room um, and uh, to see so many members from the community as well as our uh, small campus here. If you don't know the campus, um, although it is, it's become a bit of a landmark because of the design of the building, um, please stop by. We'd be happy to give you a tour and uh, show you around and explain to you what we're all about. Um, but uh, uh, tonight, of course, we are here to talk about AI and I would say, what a more fitting topic uh, could there be when 2023 is supposed to be the year of AI? I promise I won't talk about chat GPT, although I'm, I'm sure we will. Um, as a, a university, it is always important to stay at the forefront and to be part of conversations around current technologies and um, technological evolutions and inventions. And at the, the Stratford School and, of course, at the university itself, we work closely with industry and government um, to discuss 
how we may adopt new technologies such as AI as it becomes more widely used, as it will, um, in, in the near future. So, um, and like Charmaine said, it is important to do this in an ethical way and to develop um, adoption positively and, and ethically and to think about those issues as well. So I think this is where the university will, can play an important role. Um, and of course, at the, the Stratford School itself, um, we have experts in AI. So we have Dr. Will Zhao, uh, who is one of our recent hires. Um, so we count him among our faculty at the Stratford School, and he will be discussing this topic together with the other wonderful panelists that we have. And with that, I hope you're going to enjoy the evening. Thank you again for coming out, and I'll pass it back to Charmaine. Thank you. So if you bear with me a little bit, the way we found the flow works best is if we introduce all four speakers right at the start so that you get a little bit of knowledge of who they are and what they're doing. And then that doesn't interrupt the flow of the speakers afterwards. So what I'll do is it's going to be a lengthy introduction because I'm going to introduce all four of them. But then after that, we get into the meat of the discussion today, and they'll just flow one after the other in a panel presentation. So first, Kesha Bodawala. So Kesha is the model development lead at PNP Optica in Waterloo. She oversees machine learning team in developing models to assess the quality of meat products. She has a master's degree in electrical and computer engineering with a focus on machine learning and a bachelor's degree in electronics engineering. Can everybody hear me well? Excellent. Kesha, great to have you here. We also have Evan Jones. Evan is the founder of Stitch Media. It's an interactive media production service company. It tells stories using new technology and, and also timeless technologies. Um, uh, it's a two-time Emmy Award winner. Evan's work combines web, mobile, and games with TV, film, radio, and the real world. He was recognized as the top 10 new media groundbreaker. And this is by the Bell Fund. He was also chosen as one of the most innovative and influential minds by his, alum, his university, McMaster University. We'll forgive you for that. Um, his interactive, he's got documentary interactive work that won the best in electronic culture at the UNESCO World Summit and his experience with branded entertainment won the best in digital marketing by the DG Awards. He's guest lectured on art and business, interactive storytelling at Canadian Film Theater, the Australian Film, the Television and Radio School, University of California, among other places. He's also consulted for the Smithsonian, for Greenpeace, for Microsoft, Disney, NBC, Universal, Nickelodeon, a lot of major companies, uh, including, I think, 20th Century Fox as well. So glad to have you here today. We also have Sharisha Rambathia. And Sharisha is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Waterloo. She leads the Critical Machine Learning Lab as the director. Her research focuses on developing deep learning-based, reliable artificial intelligence models for real-world decision-making in surgery and healthcare, and also COVID spread, climate change, intelligent manufacturing and aviation using modeling that's spatiotemporal, using a different kinds of learning techniques, and, and her work spans both theory and practice of machine learning. It's been published at, the, it, at her organization in a whole variety of major venues. And it's not just computer science venues, but also venues such as uh, a journal called Surgery, 
one called the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases, and so on. So a true practitioner, really good to have you here. She's also a recipient of the Medal Award for Excellence in Research from the University of Southern California. Will Zhao is our final panelist. Will is an assistant professor in Stratford, so the Stratford School of Interaction, Interaction Design and Business, and that's our Stratford School here at Waterloo. He has his PhD degree from the French Grand Ecole E.M. Lyon Business School, and he pursued postdoctoral research at Stanford University. He's an interdisciplinary researcher. He's interested in studying innovation from organizational, educational, engineering perspectives, and he used all sorts of metals, methods that use artificial intelligence techniques. He's got a lot of publications that I won't mention here, um, but many, many, one of the recent publications in artificial intelligence was published in the IE Transactions in Cyber, Cybernetics. So let's welcome all four speakers. So now we can get on to the AI talk. I'd also like to introduce, finally, Bernie Dunker. Bernie is our Associate Vice President, and he manages the whole interdisciplinary research file at the University of Waterloo. And he's going to moderate your questions at the end. So the order of the speakers is Sarisha first, and then Evan, then Kesha, then Will. And we'll flow through, so I won't be coming up here again. We'll just flow from speaker to speaker. So let's start with you, Sarisha. Thank you. So I was lecturing today, so I've already prepared to talk in front of a lot of people today, I guess. So uh, good evening, everyone. I am uh, Sarisha Rambhatla. I, am, I lead the Critical Machine Learning Lab at the University of Waterloo, uh, I'm all, where I'm an assistant professor in the uh, Department of Management Sciences in the Faculty of Engineering, uh, cross-appointed in Systems Design Engineering and also Computer Science Department. And today, I will be talking about AI and the future of healthcare, where we are, where are we headed, and what are the major challenges where AI can actually help us. So when we think about the future of healthcare um, and the challenges pertaining to Canada and actually the world, one of the main questions and in the next few decades that we have to tackle is actually aging populations. And this number in Canada in 2014, about only 15% of the population was above the age of 65, which by 2040, will be above the age of 25, and I will be one of those people. So mostly this is also for me. Um, and this is actually a good thing. This is showing that we are making advancements and we have longer life expectancies. But we also have to think about the quality of life I will be leading at that time. Juxtaposed with this, we have we are going through a nursing and clinical health workers a shortage in Canada and actually across the world. And in the main statistic here is in 2020, one third of the nurses in Canada were above the age of 50. And actually during the pandemic, a lot more people have left due to a variety of reasons, including burnout. So AI can definitely help us create a future where we can support our clinical staff. However, even right now in healthcare systems, there is widespread inequalities. So there is, of course, an issue of race and how that affects your outcomes. There is gender issues and also your indigenous status and how the medical uh, system actually treats you. So really, yes, AI-powered healthcare technologies can address and help us scale 
all, that, all the efforts that our clinical and our limited clinical staff is putting in. However, they can actually reinforce the same biases that we have. And why is that? The real reason for that is we're learning from historical data. And the historical data is impacted by whatever is happening at that point in time. So that's great. And, but let's start thinking about how can we fix this? So if we think about AI for healthcare applications, and I will like read that because you may not be able to read the small text there, um, but there are a wide variety of applications, including drug discovery and nursing robots and what we call as ambient intelligence as in uh, systems that can help um, as we age and as we lead our lives to uh, detect certain kinds of conditions. So out of these, um, my work, and I will go through a lens, I will go through the entire process with the lens of my research, and it focuses on uh, telemedicine. Uh, I have work on healthcare monitoring, um, healthcare triage, and AI, AI for surgery uh, threads, and also uh, clinical decision making. So mostly my work spans these areas. Now, so one of the recent exciting threads is with University Health Network in uh, Toronto. And in, on this thread, we actually look for, uh, we're looking into how wait-listed age aging populations and actually uh, act people above the age of 65 when they get based, uh, waitlisted for liver transplantation, they're usually not chosen for transplantations because the current metrics that we have, which chooses a person or does not choose a person, does not very work very well for that age category. So they're kind of disadvantaged there. So we're trying to see how their trajectories actually evolve uh, via these kind of models to see how they will uh, fare well like once they uh, get onto the wait list for, to get a transplant. Now, this is very different from like US to Canada where in US you will uh, mostly find like insurance and, and your uh, full-time work status and these kind of things impacting. So we wanna see and correct that when we are using our data, it is actually transferable to the Canadian case. Anyway. Uh, so on the other front, I have uh, my students, uh, finally a DS design team actually, develop a telemedicine app where uh, a physiotherapist can now uh, see if their patients are doing all the things properly or not, and if actually they're adhering to the program. Um, on uh, one of the other exciting threads is I have a work with Grand River Hospital on trustworthy AIs. Uh, models, model building, and we, even before we do that, we're looking in their historical data to see if there are any existing biases we should be um, aware of so that we don't end up propagating the same things. Then I have, uh, in, this was my postdoctoral work at University of Southern California, where I, uh, this is an example of uh, surgeons actually practicing their suturing skills in a virtual reality environment and we are trying to actually uh, give them feedback of what they're doing right and what they're not doing right, so to train them. Um, and also on a similar like, thread, I also have um, whether we should get like, given a picture of a burn wound, whether we should go for surgery or not. Uh, believe it or not, right now it is a 50-50% chance that surgeons get it right. And so we can actually avoid a lot of surgeries, unnecessarily uh, surgical interventions. Um, I also worked on a lot of OAI for COVID threads, including one of the first works on uh, misinformation, uh, COVID misinformation back in uh, March 2020, and uh, how to come up with risk scores in different areas of the cities so that we can have more policy interventions saying we will open up this part of the city and not this other part and so on. Uh, but we all know how that went. Anyway, so, uh, 
on, on some other things. Um, uh, and those were my healthcare threats. I also work, have worked with Nissan on intelligent uh, manufacturing. I'm currently working with NavBlue, which is like uh, local to Waterloo, on how do we improve aviation operations using AI. And uh, other more fundamental threads on deep learning explainability and this physics-informed machine learning, which is mostly for uh, climate um, and AI for essentially climate change. Um, so with this, I guess what I see as a future of AI is that we need to actually tackle those challenges. And yes, AI will be used for that. But more importantly, we have to use trustworthy AI solutions as we ultimately want humans um, who, who are big, ultimately like we have these models impacting human lives. And so I see the future of AI as human-centered AI. And that is the most important part for these complex problems that we want to solve. And uh, this is where I want to plug in my department, where I'm really fortunate to be at. And we have a mix of uh, more technical, uh, like information, uh, information sciences people and operations research people, along with people who, can, uh, who know about how organizations and humans work with each other. So yeah, that's, I guess, a plug. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Yeah. Thank you. I guess I also forgot to uh, thank for the great introduction, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. I uh, endured that long bio as well. I'm going to try to speak up a little bit because Lisa says I need to be louder. Uh, I am not going to put you through the same long bio. Uh, I had a few slides to talk about that. You've already heard all of it, and, uh, and so I'm going to jump ahead. Hold on just a moment. We don't need any of that. I'm going to talk instead about going back in time 20 years ago where I did the most undergraduate thesis title I could ever imagine. The effect of artificial art on the state of mankind. Can you imagine <laughs> how pretentious that could be? Uh, I've been thinking about this stuff for a while, and, uh, and I really was, uh, at the time, passionate talking about music in AI and how it was going to affect the way that we feel about music, and, uh, and this is a, a glimpse at my past. Instead, though, we're going to fast forward 20 years and we're going to look at the finished product, which you see before you today, uh, much more jaded. But the, uh, the, the, this is uh, one of many AI images that you may have seen out there in the world, and uh, it won an award recently. What I wanted to really sort of hammer home as the sort of theme of today is that in my world, you only see the final product. And, uh, and what I would like to talk about instead is how maybe something that we might call human-centered AI is really all about process. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of the work that I do and, uh, and how I have been... I'm going to just pick this up because I'm going to step away from it over here. Okay, so I'm going to show you a few projects that we've made. One of them is called Rival Books of Aster. It was made with the Games Institute at the University of Waterloo. And uh, it is a strategy game, but like all games, it started like this. This is how the first version of this game looked. And what I wanted to mention is that part of every project that we do involves prototyping. So you may not see this, but uh, prototyping is part of our process. And by prototyping, we're always trying to do the minimum viable product to be able to get that project together as quickly as we can, because we need to assess whether or not it works. Every single project exists in sort of a spectrum of like where it's working and where it's not working. It may not be good or bad because it's not finished yet. It just is leaning in the right direction in some places and sometimes it's leaning away from where you want to be. So I'll take you through some other projects that we have done in the past. This is another uh, game, completely different game called Terrarium. And this game in its own way looked like this at the beginning. Uh, which is, uh, you know, one of the first iterations of this game. It looks much better now. It worked like this, and, and you know, as an undergrad, maybe I would have been happy with this work because this would took us a while to get to. But one of the things that I really wanted to say is that, you know, every iteration in our work 
is a stepping stone to the next uh, improvement. You know, we, we can't look at the final product and say, oh, yeah, you had all of that the first time. It's always uh, a process that we're moving through. And so every single one of our projects goes through that process. This is another project. It's a virtual reality escape room called Flow Weaver. It's on the Oculus right now. And what I wanted to show you was one of the early concepts of it, which was called photo bashing. I don't know if everybody here uses photo bashing in their daily life, but the concept behind it is that every single thing in this picture that you see has been stolen from somewhere. And, uh, and that is because we have cut out pieces of things, like for instance, this float up here is a, is a thing, you know, a photo that we found of a fisherman's float made of glass, and we cut it out and we put it together because we wanted to see if we could make a sort of concept that we would then be able to build into a game. And so everything here is stolen, but everything here is ours, which is built again from scratch once we had made the decisions uh, that we were on the right track and that we really wanted to make something in that way. So we used those sort of stolen images as our inspiration and like people like Picasso say, you know, all, all art is stolen. So uh, I'm gonna walk you through different projects as well. This is the project that we're working on right now called Broken Spectre. And the way that we got to this sort of iconic, you know, poster that we were trying to make, uh, what we did was we created a mood board. And I don't know if any of you have made mood boards before, but what we were trying to do in our process was that we were trying to find inspirational images that would inform the way that we wanted to create something. We were trying to find a common language as a team that would allow us to get to the projects that we wanted to make together. And we weren't all seeing it the same way until we started to say, well, it's got a little bit of this and it's got some of that. And you can see here, if I just back up one slide, that we ended up here and you can pretty much see where we got from you know, the different ty types of things that we were doing. But yet again, every single one of these pictures has been stolen from somewhere. And it's because these are our inspirations that are, that are coming through. We don't use these in our final work, but we do take a lot of inspiration from them and we, they're tools that get us where we need to go. And so then a little tool was invented. Some of you have known them as uh, they, they call, call them stable diffusion. Sometimes they are called mid-journey. Sometimes they are called dolly. There's different tools out there that exist that do the same sorts of things, which is a concept called text to image, which is that they have taken a bunch of images from the world at large and said, okay, we are putting those into a, like a, you know, a, a model, and that model can then be prompted with text. And so that is now one of our process. We are now working on a new project called Elsewhere Electric. This project is an asymmetric co-op game for VR where one person plays inside VR and the other person is sort of back at headquarters and they, uh, and they help them out on a flat screen and help guide them through this mysterious facility. And we had all of these words that we were trying to use to capture this project. You know, we were saying it was like sort of a retro futuristic world and had these like sort of strange corporate espionage vibes to it. And so we started to prompt Dolly. And so I will just start with where we started and the, the path that it took us on and give you a, a few examples. And so we started by talking about liminal spaces and strange architecture and we started giving it these words to say, hey, give us some pictures that will show you what we mean. And so we got this and we went, no, that's not what we meant. And it gave us this and, and we sort of said, well, no. And it, it challenged us to think about, well, what are we talking about? Like, wait a minute, if you're spitting this out, you know, this would be a prime example of us saying, well, no, this doesn't have enough color. And then, okay, here it is with color. And, and you say, well, no, that's also not what I mean. Uh, I'm not trying to get that. Okay, well, what about this? And you're like, no, that's the wrong part of the 80s. We don't want that part. Uh, this is, you're going in the wrong path for us. And so then we say, all right, well, maybe this. 
And every single one of these are images that have been created from models that are quite complex and I'm not gonna be here to tell you how they work. What I'm gonna do is talk about how they're used and they're used to create a dialogue, which is that we take a look at this and we say, this is far too cliched. Everybody's gonna know that we're trying to like rip off Alien or something with this. And so we're, we're brainstorming with, uh, with a, a companion in this. So then we get to this and we say, wow, this is really not what we expected. Uh, this looks like some kind of like neon laundromat that's all defunct. And, uh, and we, so then it starts to take us in another direction. Okay, the color is exciting to us. We are now talking about what's working and what's not working. We're using that same prototyping mentality to sort of critically analyze what, it, what it's giving us in terms of like what are the emergent properties that are coming out of the creative process for us. And so, okay, colorful laundromat, what's that gonna be? And then suddenly we're here in these, these sort of abandoned spaces. We're very much obsessed with the idea that like everything feels creepy when it's been sort of derelict for a while and who's gonna come back to discover it. So we start feeding it things like this and then we say, okay, but there's gonna be a monster out there that you're not gonna be alone in this space. Okay, so put someone in there. And then they do and we say, okay, so you've got the colors, you've got the thing, but now this style is all wrong. We don't want it to look like that. And we are honing in on an iterative process that is happening so much quicker than you would ever imagine that it could have been with our, with our you know, previous attempts to put together mood boards and things like that. Because we don't have to search for images based on text prompts. We can now create those images for our internal process. None of this is gonna end up in our project because it is fraught with copyright problems. And, uh, and that is another conversation that we can have, but it is a tool that is guiding us through this, this path. So eventually we start to get like narrowed in and you can see how these prompts are starting to say, okay, we've got kind of like a retro vibe, but we've got like splashes of color, a person in the scene, and then we get to this. And this is where we stop and we say, that's what the project looks like. That's it. It has these weird office chairs and these like tall, tall windows that seem to lead to nowhere. And the, why is he wearing a hazmat suit? And all of these things were stumbled upon by giving a large open space, the room to sort of meander while we were creatively engaging with the project. And so what I wanna talk about is actually thinking about a new augmented reality. I know that some of you probably are very familiar with virtual reality. You're also probably thinking about augmented reality and a lot of people might think that that is like glasses with pictures on them and you're gonna just see like, you know, your, your text bubbles over top of people's heads or something like that, but there is a new way to augment reality in the creative space where we are now enabling uh, a quicker level of iteration in the creative science, uh, like the creative work that we do. We're able to go back and forth and sort of say, no, that's not what I'm imagining. I'm imagining this and correcting myself for that. You can see it's also coming up in the coding world as well, is that you know, you've seen projects that, that come out of things like GitHub Copilot. It's the same concept. There's a large model of data and it is prompting answers to what you're putting in there. So you're starting something and it's sort of continuing it from that point. The thing is, I think that this is beautifully named. I think the GitHub Copilot is the right mental model for you to think of, is that it's not taking over your job as pilot, it's acting as your co-pilot and it's supporting you in the work that you're doing. The, this is just a quote that I think really sparked a lot of my imagination, is that this is Michelangelo talking about, you know, the sculpture is in the marble. I just have to chisel away all the superfluous material. And I think that that's the way that I am choosing to engage with the AI that is available to me, which is that the model has it in there, the thing that I need, and it's my job to get it out. And so that is part of the artistic process now what I want to confess is that I am actually uh, five times rejected uh, at the Canada Council. I've already spoken at the Canada Council many times as an advisor there, but they took 20 years to accept me as a digital artist. And one of the reasons was because everything that I did was too commercial, too applied, too 
Uh, it was pretty pictures and it was nice words, but it was not art. And I spoke at length with them about it. And over the last 20 years, I have come to really appreciate the difference between uh, you know, making something that looks good versus art. And I think really it comes down to the concept of an artist's statement is that if you have not made a statement about what your art is supposed to be, then it's not really art. Things can look good, things can do amazing things, but you have to have something at the core that you are trying to say. And right now, all of the models that we have used in the, the tools that we have are helping enable those statements to come to life. They're not taking them away from us. So I would really encourage you to make your statement and, uh, and I look forward to having the discussion with you all. Hi everybody, um, I'm Keisha Vodawala and I am model development lead at PNP Optica or PPO. So, um, my company, sorry, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. Uh, my, comp my company basically assesses the quality of food products and uh, my team is responsible for the artificial intelligence side of um, the company. So we decide what good data might look like for our application, analyze that data, come up with machine learning models, um, and put those models into production. Okay, so what do I mean by food quality here? Um, you must have heard of food recalls at your local grocery stores, and they are mostly due to foreign contaminants like a small piece of plastic or metal. Um, our PPO uses spectroscopy and artificial intelligence to clean the food product of such foreign contaminants and make sure that the food product is safe to consume. To, to give you guys a little bit of context, I want to show you a video of the system in action. So the system can detect multiple foreign materials like wood and metal. The product goes to the system on a conveyor belt, and the system is scanning this product and looking for foreign materials using artificial intelligence. And when a foreign object is found, the system rejects those um, pieces and if the food product is safe, it moves on to the next conveyor belt. So that's how um, the entire process happens. So let's talk about the first part of technology, which is spectroscopy. Um, spectroscopy helps us understand the chemical composition of food products and foreign materials. In very simple words, when an object is illuminated by a light source, that object absorbs some of the light waves and reflects the rest back. So for example, black color looks black because, because it, it absorbs all of the visible light and reflects nothing back. So by uh, measuring the light reflected, you can understand chemical composition of an object. And that's exactly what we do. So for example, by measuring the light reflected from a pork loin, you can um, divide the pork loin into different portions, such as bone and cartilage, protein, fat, and even a very small piece of plastic. Um, here are some real life examples of foreign material found, found by our system. In the first case, the system found a small piece of stainless steel. In the other one, um, the system found a strand of plastic. Okay, now let's talk about the second part, artificial intelligence. Before we move on, um, I'm gonna go into some of the technical details of artificial intelligence, and in order to do that, we need to understand the difference between artificial intelligence, which is AI, and machine learning, which is ML. Um, artificial intelligence is uh, a machine's ability to mimic human intelligence, while machine learning is a machine's ability to automatically learn from data. So you can say that machine learning is a way to achieve artificial intelligence. And at PNP Optica, we use machine learning um, to finish the task at hand. Okay, so let's talk about what machine learning is all about. So I always say that training a machine learning model 
is like training a toddler to do something. So now, let's say we want to train a, a, a toddler to differentiate between cats and dogs. Now, here we are assuming that the toddler has never seen any images, videos, or real life examples of cats and dogs, and this is their first understanding of cats and dogs. So one very effective way to do this would be to show them images of cats and dogs, and once you have shown enough images, you might want to check their understanding. So you show them an image and ask them whether it's a cat or a dog. Now, if they give the correct answer, you provide positive feedback. If they give incorrect answer, you provide negative feedback. And the um, hope is that the toddler is learning based on this feedback. Now, if you are happy with the progress, then you are done, you don't need to do anything else. But if you are not happy, then you might want to uh, repeat the entire process. And that's exactly how machine learning models work. So if you want to train a machine learning model to differentiate between cats and dogs, you show examples of cats and dogs to the model, the model makes some predictions, the model gets some feedback based on those predictions, and then model learns from that feedback. And this entire process is repeated unless you are happy with the model's performance. So for example, um, until the model can correctly identify cats and dogs um, for 95 out of 100 images. Now, what does it mean to our application? So again, to train a machine learning model, you need to show some examples. Now, remember that there is food product going through the system on a conveyor belt, and there might be foreign materials in it. So the system sees three things, belt, product, and foreign material. So you need to show examples of all three things. Now let's look at some challenges that we might face with such diverse data set. OK, let's go back to our cats versus dogs problem. Now, let's imagine that you showed only these five images to the toddler. Okay. Do you think the toddler would be able to correctly identify this new data point? I don't think so. Do you think that's because, this, uh, because the toddler was not paying enough attention? Again, I don't think so. I think because the original data set was missing images of dogs from this particular angle. So what does that tell us? That tells us that models are very much dependent on the data they see. So it's not just the quantity of the data, but also the quality of the data that makes a big difference. In order to develop a thorough understanding of dogs, you need to feed examples of dogs from all different angles and them doing all different activities like running and sleeping and barking and eating and so on. So what does that um, mean for PPO? Okay, so at PPO, we use spectroscopy, and spectroscopy data is very much sensitive to temperature and humidity. So we need to just make sure that the uh, machine is aware of uh, the changes in temperature and humidity. We also provide uh, predictions for transparent foreign materials like cling wrap and um, thin plastics. So here on the right side, under the blending section, you can see that the same foreign material on different backgrounds can look very different. And that's true for spectroscopy too. So you need to make sure that the machine can understand this. Also, the definition of product might change a lot from customer to customer. Some customers want us to reject bone fragments while others don't. Sometimes you see blood spots um, on, on food products. Sometimes the food product is frozen, so there are like huge chunks of ice. And sometimes um, you see some ir irregularities like grease and fat and veins and so on. So in order to develop a thorough understanding of product, you need to have a very strong database, including all such product variations. 
at PPO, um, we do collect and annotate our own data set. Uh, we, have a, we have a data services team that does that for us. Um, one of the team members is right here. Um, yeah, but that's a really huge task because you have to take care of so many different variables. Sometimes it's just not possible to differentiate between food products and foreign materials. So when food product is really wet, you see reflections from the food products, and they can look very similar to some foreign materials, like reflective plastics or reflective metals. So in that case, um, the system might get confused and start detecting good product as foreign material and start rejecting it. So some clever things need to be done in order to reduce such false rejections. Okay. So we have grown a lot trying to solve these challenges. Um, we have made mistakes and we have learned from those mistakes. Um, but one important lesson I learned at PPO is um, the importance of customer education. So it's essential that you um, set the right expectations with the customer about what your AI can and cannot do. Um, also, PPO provides some other quality solutions, such as uh, fat lean analysis for pork and tenderness of chicken breast. I'm not going to talk about them. If you're interested in them, we can talk about it offline. Um, yeah, so spectroscopy in food industry is kind of a unique solution. As far as I know, nobody in the world is doing that, which is kind of scary at times because you are on your own. So if you are stuck in a problem, you can't just Google the problem and try to figure it out. But um, despite all of that, um, I promise that we'll keep experimenting and keep improving our systems. Thank you for listening to me. And now um, I'll pass this on to Will, who's going to talk about chatbots. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, that was great uh, presentations. So I'm particularly appreciative of the previous one because you did all the difficult work of explaining the terminology for me. Uh, my name is Will I'm at uh, Stratford School of U of W. Um, I'm going to talk about something that, that I researched on for quite a bit, for quite a while. But up until two months ago, no one wanted to talk about it. Actually, you would hate interacting with that technology. And something happened two months ago that changed everything. Now, people want to talk to me now because I study that, <laughs> right? That is chatbot. So the roadmap. I don't have a roadmap, I only have 10 minutes, so I'll skip that 45 seconds. <laughs> right, so moving on. So what is a chatbot? It's an intangible robot, okay, that performs somewhat automated uh, informational tasks. Um, so basic, the basic idea is whether you're dealing with a verbal or the voice-based chatbot or text-based chatbot, you input unstructural human language. Okay, our language is not that structured. But then you get some output that is also somewhat human-like and a lot more structural. Um, I talk about how people didn't want to interact with it. That was uh, not entirely true. In fact, uh, before this thing called ChatGPT uh, Chat came into being, we had a lot of enthusiasm, but mainly from organizations, not a lot from public, uh, general public. The members of general public didn't want to interact a lot with chatbot. You would hate interacting with chatbot. You wanted a real person in the services you but then organizations really love that. So we have this um, organizational enthusiasm versus pub public, I call it public nonchalance situation here. Um, why organizations were so happy about having chatbot technology? Uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, we believe that, I mean, organizations believe that chatbot uh, would allow us to, to uh, give us the op opportunity, opportunity to do faster, cheaper, and more accurate analysis of vast amount of data. For example, uh, we have a lot of applications um, in finance, um, MasterCard, and many other companies, they develop a chatbot to facilitate the services that you would conduct, uh, they would conduct with you. In education, chatbot have been mobilized to help students learn, to learn with them. For example, in Stanford uh, University, they developed some chatbot that really answers some of the content-related questions for the students. At the University of Waterloo at Stratford School, myself and <laughs> my students were developing chatbot that actually help, that can potentially help our online students feel less isolated 
Because when you're studying online, you're by yourself. But then human beings no longer, you know, if, even if online education is great, but somehow a lot of our students feel like I am just all by myself. I still want to have that human connections. And chatbot can potentially help us give our students back that kind of human connections. Even in public service, um, chatbot has been mobilized. Uh, this is the Japanese example. So Hitachi uh, developer chatbot that was uh, uh, massively mobilized in a lot of public services. According to Hitachi, using chatbot is not only good for your business, it's also good for the environment. So it saves carbon emission, according to him. It's too small, my apologies. So it saves carbon emissions by 40%. Some of you are already thinking that means 40% of the work that was originally done by human beings are now done by. So is that a good thing or not? Moving on. So we talked about organizational enthusiasm, but there's also this public nonchalance. People didn't want to interact with chatbot. What do we see you know, from our research? We interviewed a lot of people, um, medical practitioners, uh, students, uh, educators, uh, business practitioners, etc. Some common themes that we got from our research is that, you know, A, they, found, they, find, using, they find chatbots hard to use. Remember two months ago before ChatGPT was there? Was that your experience? It's very hard to use. So we saw this unwillingness for customers to input your data. I don't want to give my data, although I know I have to give them my data for this task to be finished. Also, mindfulness of sensitive data. So when you're dealing with a cumbersome chatbot, you're very mindful about what kind of data I'm giving them. Also, most customers at the time found information by, generated by chatbots dubious, right? So they would prefer to have human intervention. I don't know whether that happened to you. It happened to me, actually, quite often in the past. You know, when I'm, whether I was dealing with a voice-based chatbot or text-based, I always wanted to find a shortcut that allows me to talk to a real person, right? I actually memorized some of, the, some of the keys, such as number seven, you hit number seven, or zero, that gets you to a real human being, right? And also, people find, you know, people wanted to engage in what we call, you know, in nerdy terms, triangulation. Basically, you want to find different sources that talk about the same information so that you know whether this information that you got from one source is right or wrong. So you triangulate, you verify. Now this is typically what happened two months ago. Let me just give you some exaggerated interactions. For example, a chat, text-based chatbot, typically you would have, please select an option above, and then you would type, let me see main menu. And then the answer would be, please select an option above. And then you would say, see original options. And then the answer would be, please select an option above. I can go on for one hour. <laughs> Speech-based chatbots. You're talking to people on the phone, but actually no, you're talking to chatbot. You know, this frustration was definitely shared by me on a weekly basis, right? I want to speak to your programmer, okay? All right. So all this seems to have changed overnight, right, starting two months ago. So what really happened here? Why people changed from that person that didn't want to interact, didn't want to have anything to do with this technology to someone that wants to have everything to do, especially our students, right? They want to have everything to do with this technology. So what happened? There's something called GPT, right? So generative pre-training transformer, which is a language model, pre-trained on massive data set of text and fine-tuned fine on specific tasks, specific data. So there are two things here that are quite interesting. First, they can generate text that is coherent and relevant to your topic. So no more, please provide, you know, that kind of, and also it can maintain its context across turns of the dialogue. Now this is really amazing. Maybe it doesn't really sound that amazing, but this is really thanks to the second wave of our AI. The word context is very important. Now remember, why did we want to have robot? Right, chatbot is just one type of robot. Why did we want to have a robot? Right, 400 years ago, when we first started you know, imagining having a robot, we wanted to have the kind of technology that would have the ability to imi um, imitate human abilities, right? 
Now, for chatbot, it's the same. We wanted to have an intangible bot that could imitate human conversational abilities. Now, why ChatGPT is so interesting? Because now it allows... So finally, with ChatGPT, now chatbots can imitate human conversational abilities that, is context, that are contextual in somewhat convincing manner. So you would actually believe that, okay, this is contextual. Now, let me explain a little bit about this term contextual. So the key difference between the previous generation of chatbot and this generation of chatbot is the ability to understand context. So context, everyone understands that. We are human beings, so typically we understand the current topic of our conversation. We understand the intent, or we try to understand the intent of the person that we are talking to, we're talking with. And we actually could remember a lot of our previous interactions that have already taken place. Now, these are contextual information. Now, let me give you a kind of nerdy example here. See, here there's a excerpt that I got from my own research, very boastful. We talk about six levels of chatbot autonomy. For example, level zero, there's no autonomy. The chatbot can only perform pre-programmed responses. Level number one, chatbot assisted services. So you're gonna have to give the chatbot some suggestions and the chatbot would give you some answers. Level number two, task autonomy. This means that the chatbot can perform specific tasks initiated by human beings such as ChatGPT. Now, what are we talking about? Autonomy. All right, so let's finish this talk about autonomy and I'll see you in a week's time on the street. And we continue our conversation. And now throw the word autonomy into our conversation. You should know autonomy is not commonly used in the context of artificial intelligence. Typically, when you talk about autonomy, you think about politics. You think about geographical locations. But then, imagine I see you next week, same time, on the street, despite we are in the darkness. When I say autonomy, and you'll be like, oh, you're talking about the different levels of autonomy of chatbots. This is pretty natural for human beings. But two months ago, chatbot couldn't do that. Now they can. This is very, very important. Now, this is also scary. Why? Because this is not something that researchers have been talking a lot about. Now, so far, what researchers on chatbots and its applications in business and organizations typically talk about these things that everyone are quite familiar with. We talk about privacy, data. We talk about accountability, right? We talk about explainability. So do we really understand the algorithm or not? Now, these are the common challenges of the chatbot. But one thing that we haven't been talking, we haven't been talking so much about, and which I think should be talked a lot about in this generation, for this generation of chatbot, is this, trust. But in the reversed perspective, now, if you remember our conversation so far, our discussion on trust in the mainstream research is this. We need to develop a responsible chatbot we need, to, we need to develop a responsible AI technologies so that human beings can trust them, right? So that we can trust human beings, we can trust the AI technologies. But with the second generation or the new generation of ChatGPT, you know, you only need to talk to your friends who are attending university to know how much trust they have towards ChatGPT. So, the reversed trust perspective is one that we haven't really talked a lot about, and I feel that it might be a very important thing. Otherwise, our society might be at danger. We're talking about tsunami. I'm playing a little bit of the devil's advocate role here, because I'm the only one that talks about the tsunami, this, this dire consequence it might have. So, so far, a lot of our research effort from social science, from engineering, have been about managing, managing distrust by the users. I guess it's time for us to think about how to manage trust by the users towards AI, right? Because the consequences of trusting new generations of conversational AI could be very serious. Let me give you a reminder of what we talked about at the very beginning of my 10 minutes. Remember public nonchalance? People didn't want to deal with it. Now what we are looking at is the exact opposite I call it public enthusiasm now. 
Now, now a lot of people find chatbots addictive to use, not difficult to use, but addictive to use. We are willing to engage conversations. Have a show of hand if you use chatbot, please. Chat GPP. If you spend only one hour, raise your hand. <laughs> if you spend more than one hour, raise your hand. There you go. Thank you. Right. So you're, we're willing to engage conversations. Talk to yourself. Two months ago, you that that you would call this you crazy. Right. And also, the, another danger is there is this danger of inadvertent disclosure of sensitive data. We love interacting with the chatbot so much, we actually don't remember how much data we gave the chatbot. So we didn't intentionally leak con confidential information, but we might have already. Now, does, does that scare people already? All right, second, we find information by chatbot authoritative now. Remember, before we find it dubious. Now we find the information authoritative. Talk to my students who use ChatGPT. If they, if they ask them, hey, so you got this answer from this prompt to ChatGPT, do you trust it? If you don't trust it, what you do? Two months ago, they would say, I will Google it. I will Wikipedia it. I will talk to people. Now they will tell you, I will ask ChatGPT to generate another answer. Right? So preference of multiple prompts this is actually an echo to my <laughs> to Evan's point, right? We don't like it. Instead of having, you know, having uh, making a phone call to artist friend, we asked AI to do another one, right? Now, also, we are at the danger of losing our motivation for triangulation, which is looking for information from different sources. Now, recently, I've been teaching innovation, corporate innovation, to my undergraduate student at Stratford School. We talk about how. Companies typically have three approaches to innovation. A, they grow innovation organically, they develop it. B, they acquire it. C, they do it collaboratively. So they do some by themselves, or they do some, and at the same time, they collaborate with others. So the danger of acquiring innovation too much is this. Most companies, according to research, that got used to this approach, eventually lose their ability to innovate lose their ability to generate patents. Now this is similar here. We might lose the motivation for triangulation and we might lose our vigilance about information authenticity. We don't want to check and verify, but in fact, our colleagues here, our experts here, everyone will tell you that you need to double check because AI is not that reliable yet. So I'm finishing this. I guess what I'm trying to say here is this. Chatbot is a great thing, but we need to move from existing questions to more futuristic questions. The, the ex existing questions that we've been asking ourselves are, um, for example, what skills are needed in the world of contextual AI? In the world of high autonomy chatbot, we've been talking a lot about this. We talk about what are the new jobs that's gonna be created, what are the jobs that will be lost, how do we train our students, the next generation of Canadian citizens to really live and work in that era. But maybe we need to start thinking about and start asking ourselves futuristic questions. That is, what will happen if our citizens' new evolved skill sets that would eventually become fully compatible with the existence of high autonomy chatbots and other robotic technologies before we fully address the trust issue. In other words, before we fully address this trusting in AI issue, and our society has already become highly compatible with this existence of high, econo high autonomy chatbots, then what will we do? Now, whether you are a replacementist, this is a term I coined, replacementists are people who are worried about AI technology because they think jobs would be replaced. Their jobs would be replaced. Um, whether you are a replacementist or you are a collaborationist, actually I got a new term, I think it's much better than my collab collaborationist, that is the co-pilot. If you are a co-pilot believer, whether you are in the first scenario, the first, first profile or the second profile, I think this is the important question that you need to start asking yourselves. Thank you very much, that was my talk.
thanks everyone. Uh, question probably specifically for Sarisha. Um, how do you see AI impacting the future of personalized medicine? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of, I think we're already seeing those, right? We are already living through that time. For example, your smartwatches are currently tracking your health. You have all these apps where you go out for your training or you're doing gym or you're tracking your food and all these kind of things. It's already happening. I think there will be a move towards uh, telemedicine, uh, but in terms of how I think about it is it's now the hospitals which need to change and actually catch up. Um, we have pretty old systems. Um, and when we start looking at the data, we're like, oh, we're not collecting that. So yeah, that they have to catch up. And also this other thing is um, because all this is medical, like a pri private data and it's protected by so much um, ethics reviews and all these kind of things um, for good reason. Um, but there is a push towards generating, like similar to how um, Evan is generating images and Will is generating uh, dialogues. We're trying to generate healthcare data so that uh, like where you have don't have enough data, you can actually generate that data and so on. It's already going on. For example, it's uh, going on in Ottawa Hospital and there are uh, collaborations with uh, folks at Waterloo and, and I'm part of those conversations. So um, a lot is, uh, I think, predictively telling you that, hey, you, you might have to watch out. It might become creepy at some point. Uh, but yeah, it also depends on how public reacts to chat GPT. They might even like that. So um, yeah, there is a lot to um, foster, I guess, uh, MRI scans. I mean, we're trying already like five uh, years ago, and some of the colleagues at Waterloo, they're also looking at how to uh, quickly do those things. And we know how much of backlog we have at our healthcare systems today. So things to be made more um, like efficient and assisting our clinical staff, again, uh, not replacing them. We need more, like there's already a shortage, so uh, we're trying to augment their capabilities and to even train them, yeah. So a lot on the other side of things than uh, the, your side. Yeah, thank you. Hello, okay, question for Evan and Will. If you could give a, a quick comment on how is AI gonna affect the future of creativity? The future of creativity, no, no, no big thing. Okay, uh, so I mean, what we are watching as always is the law is falling woefully behind the pace of technology. And I know that there are people watching that presentation thinking like, what does this mean for people who are visual artists or uh, even with chat GPT, you know, what does this mean for writing and the value of good writing? And I think that what we, are witnessing is that we're off the map when it comes to our legal frameworks right now. And that is about models. We have no law that talks about what the responsibilities are of these model makers that have to the original artists that worked in those spaces. And so in terms of creativity, the, the system that I wish we had developed 20 years ago when I was still obsessed with this is that we would have said, if you are incorporating somebody else's creativity into your model, then you need to measure that and every time it is used to construct something new, a fractional amount of the value that you're extracting from that should be distributed through the creativity that is built upon. That's what a lawmaker should be doing. But that is going to take so long, like it's probably a generation that we're gonna to have to endure before we can get a high enough politician to be able to appreciate what that means. And so uh, I don't know is my quick answer, but I do know what I wish could happen. So that's my quick answer. That's great. Um, but just maybe some, some minor add-ons. Um, I think the reason that it is so difficult to talk about whether 
um, there's a good way to understand AI creativity is that it is already very difficult to talk about creativity. This is something that is very hard to measure, very hard to quantify, so much so that my colleagues in education, when they design a study trying to measure whether certain intervention improves students' creativity, well, some of the common measures they use is whether they are able to create more artifacts, more things. But then we were having this conversation back and forth. You are measuring creativity by the number of creations. But we all know that creation is more than just being able to produce more stuff. So the, 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 I think, so my prediction is very um, pessimistic even. I think any legal framework would have to build upon a very clear definition of what constitutes and what constitu constitutes creativity and what doesn't constitute creativity. Before we sort out that puzzle, I think any legal uh, infrastructure that we're building will have a lot of improvement and revision you know, um, on, a, on a continual basis. Yeah, thanks. I like to comment. I think it is from the model perspective, like from machine learning perspective or AI perspective, we don't even know how to attribute what belongs to whom. Like, <laughs> so if somebody says, oh, this looks like that, we're like, uh, thank you. Uh, but there is no way the model can actually tell you I used all this. So we might actually see some of that as well, that attribution thing. Once we get to that, we can think about how can we generate more, like, uh, I guess we can pay them. But currently we don't know when it creates something, what it actually used. And that's a very big problem. So that's why there's a problem of trust, right? You don't know what it used. Uh, for ChatGPT, we know, for example, it has used, I, I like to think about it as Reddit. So, now, now, yeah, the kind of solutions that you'll get is also dependent on that. But you don't know which part of Reddit. So then how do you think about attribution? Anyway, yeah, thank you. So like Will said, um, you have to trust AI. And, uh, you know, Keisha said you have to figure out how to get the contaminants out and identify those contaminants. So I'd like to ask Sarisha, how do you take out the biases in historical data in the medical field? Yeah. Um, can you give an example of how you would do that? Because there's vast amounts of data and how do you identify yeah, those contaminants? That's, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> what is question. a contaminant? Yeah, and I will let, um, I actually can answer the medical like part of it and then I will hand it over. Um, so first things, if you have already observed bias in your data, you know about it, that you have certain groups of populations for which the outcomes were, uh, they were at a disadvantage. So when you're learning, when you, first question is identify these things in the data, establish understand your data as much as possible. Every data is different. You, we cannot just carry one model from one place and just apply it to another thing. So for example, the Canadian population may be too diverse in a particular, uh, so for example, I worked on like LA County uh, Burn Center, which is one of the largest and most diverse populations. So we can actually evaluate how the machine learning uh, model is actually making predictions. So for instance, if there are 100 people in my population and 90 of them are, uh, belong to a particular majority group and the other 10 are in a minority group, my model can have 90% accuracy, right? sorry, 100% accuracy in the term, sorry, oh wait, 90% accuracy, and you will then see um, that, hey, this is great, let's deploy it. But it always got those 10 people wrong. Right? So I can always learn uh, when there is this imbalance thing in my data, you always have to think about other ways. In, in some situations, you can upsample them, so you increase their, um, the proportion, but if the outcomes that they faced were like kind of different, 
then you actually cannot do that either. So then the concept, there are various definitions and people actually are coming up with these definitions for like past, I would say, four, four years we're seeing this is equitable outcomes. So my model should perform equally for all groups. So if I am, and, and other definitions. So um, yeah, so there, those are some of the ways we can fix, retroactively fix, but the first thing to realize is, um, is there bias in my data? If yes, there will be bias in your model. So then you fix it. And, and that's what research is about. We're trying to fix it, so yeah. And uh, I think the question was about contaminants also. So. OK. Uh, so the way you remove contaminants, so it's, it's very much like this, like um, when we are learning, uh, trying a machine learning model for contaminants, um, there is one part which is the product, and it's, it's the majority of the part is the product, while the minority part is the contaminants, which is very similar to what you are talking about, right? Um, so in, in like Sarisha said, but that's exactly what we do. We actually have separate tests for two different um, uh, groups, and we test our models on both of them and make sure that they work pretty well on both of them in both cases. And if we see that, let's say, um, like uh, everything is being uh, predicted as products, it's not detecting any of the foreign contaminants, that means you need to add more data for that foreign contaminant so that model can understand uh, contaminants better. Um, if the other, the other way around, then you need to reduce the amount of contaminants or reduce how much um, the model is, uh, how much attention the model is paying to um, the foreign contaminants. So there are various ways of doing that, but main part, like she said, is being aware of uh, what's happening and where your model is failing. Right, I, this is a, maybe an open question about the ethical considerations of the data that's being generated and what research is being done uh, and who's controlling it. I can start. I guess I'm taking all the mic time. but uh, So there is this concept of uh, data sheets for data sets. So it's similar to like how your chips, uh, the electronic chips that um, we get, we get a data sheet with that. This works very well in this range. This is the temperature you should operate this in. And it's, I guess, similar to also a lot of, um, like in your car, even you have to put certain things, uh, which I did not know. So you have to put certain kind of things uh, for it to make work. Uh, so uh, this concept of coming up, when, when I release a data, you need to get me the provenance. How did you get to this data? And uh, you need to tell me, this is how I collected it. This is what I, this is the people I removed. A lot of times we see that we drop some of the samples and samples are people. And we, we think, oh, now I have a clean data set, working with a clean data set. And I've worked like a lot with clean data set and it is only like, um, when you become more mature researcher, you understand that that's not what we should be doing. But even the whole community was using clean data sets. So the whole um, concept of uh, how was the data generated, who were actually asked these questions, who were considered for the data sets and who were excluded when this data set were collected, what attributes were collected, what were left out and why. Um, what is this good for? So what did, ultimately there is a person who is collecting them. What are their main motivations? So you may be m using it for something else and that's not okay. So, um, and that is, that is the main way that we are trying to um, like actually counter that thing and uh, for developing like data sheets for these things. And yeah, so that's, that's one of the ways. Um. Oh, yeah. We collect our own data sets so we don't have to face that issue. <laughs> yeah, well that's great. I think this is a great question. Um, I, I'm gonna waste some air time. I don't have the answer, but I, I, I just wanna highlight that this is such an important question. So far we've been talking about ethics, about data that we collect, but not the data that AI generates. So there's, a, I think it's just like the trust and mistrust thing. There's a whole range of new questions that need to be asked. 
and I don't have answer, but I think that's, you give me something to research on. That's, uh, thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> you have a co-pilot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, like, uh, something that goes into uh, chat GBD as well, right? Whose voices were considered for this? They would say, oh, this is the entire internet. But who is actually represented when we say entire internet? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. <laughs> so it English. may not be, it may, so what you'll see is that it may be good at some things and it's not good at some things. So some niche technical areas it's not good at. People usually may not be talking about that. It may not be that, um, I guess, socially okay to talk about very highly technical stuff. So yeah, you, you'll see this representation. And this is also what we talk about at differences in data distributions. Um, we usually think all classes or all groups are equally represented, but that is not true. I'll put on my ethics hat for a second. One second, and I will say, you're totally right. This is something that we all, as a collective community, we need to figure out and set standards for. And I think that the world is craving that more than ever. And uh, all the questions about chat GPT are valid. You know, should it ever have been made? Uh, and, and things like that. And I take that hat off and I say, my talk today was showing you a world in which this is happening. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in place of this idealized like world where all of our regulations work properly, we, we are forging a new place where we are applying our own standards of ethics. And I unfortunately could point you to some much less ethical projects that exist out there in the world that um, you know, aren't just people who are pawning off ChatGPT as their own writing. It's also you know, for more nefarious uses. And, uh, and so you know, there's no bottom right now when it comes to where that's happening. What I am trying to show is that you know, I, I don't feel that the work that we're doing with AI is changing the, the jobs that we currently have or replacing people. I know that people might look and say, well, you, you know, you've got a built-in concept artist who's just cranking out the images every three seconds. You know, you're not paying an army of concept artists. And I would say to you, well, we never did. We never did that before. We always just like Googled images and then just found ones that suited our, our means. And that's why I used the word stolen in my presentation because I really wanted to, to have the energy of the charged term to, to in the talk so that people would know that part of art is stealing in terms of uh, taking inspiration from other people. And, uh, and so I... Uh, I am comfortable with the status of where we are right now. It's a fascinating space, and I think uh, there's, there's going to be many ethical conversations to come. Uh, I have something to add to that. So let's just imagine that we all want to be ethical and we want, don't, like we want to produce our own data sets, right? So imagine how long it, it would have taken somebody to create a data set to train ChatGPT from scratch. Like that would have taken years, decades. And, and that's basically us holding ourselves back and we don't wanna, maybe we wanna do that, but let's just assume that we don't wanna do that. We do wanna have those um, developments in place and they should be fast enough. So I think, yeah, it should be, we should uh, think about the ethical side of the things, but at the same time, we should also talk about uh, how much impact it's having and what kind of um, improvements we are getting in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, I'm gonna go back to healthcare here a bit. Um, what do you foresee happening specifically to the healthcare workers day-to-day -day and their specific roles? Yeah. So uh, definitely it would be, I don't think, at least for now, I don't think AI would be making any of those decisions uh, and it should not be making those decisions. Uh, but it is actually to help our attention spans, which are like going really uh, low. <laughs> Uh, to actually help us see some things that we are not uh, seeing. So you will see more assistive things. 
or training purposes. The, one of the projects I worked on is uh, helping surgeons to practice their surgical skills. So we see that although there are certain patterns in which when they're like suturing a, a tube, there is an established pattern, but we see that still there is like variation. And when you show those things to different surgeons, even they don't agree that it's good or bad. So there's so much disagreement even amongst surgeons, like even amongst clinicians about certain things, that it is harder um, to leave that decision making to uh, like a model. Um, so we, uh, I mostly see that as like a support system, an assistive system and a training. Uh, I think uh, uh, Evan talked about like virtual reality environments. I think training in virtual reality environments and augmented reality environments is uh, something that will, like it's already happening in VR. So yeah, I, I think in general education, might, you might have like some of those uh, headsets and you might be practicing something, um, which actually does not put like physical restrictions, right? You, you may not be able to lift something, but you have your engineering mind or creativity and you want to do something. So uh, going back to healthcare, I think you will see more um, like progress on brand prints. We are already seeing drug discovery uh, being like, I want to touch upon that is, uh, we are seeing that people want to use this for discovering new drugs. Or like, for example, for COVID and uh, trying a new vaccine, um, like how can actually we expedite that process? So I see um, our like aim as like a society, we should see how to remove drudgery from our work so that we can do creative work. Um, so if, if like, uh, like it's a robot vacuum cleaner, if it, like nobody like, I don't know, there might be some people who like to clean, but hey, I'm so glad and grateful for a dishwasher and a robot vacuum cleaner. And I think this, this is how like I approach things is like, how can we remove that drudgery? And that can mean healthcare, they're overworked. They have, they, go through a huge amount of mental like, um, like burden. Um, and, and we saw that during COVID as well. Uh, so yeah. One, one more question and you'd already put up your hand. So here you go. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. So that was very, uh, very fascinating actually the power of AI. Um, so you have mentioned so much of the improvements and interesting things that are happening with AI, and you have talked a little bit on the um, fringe about um, ethical concerns. I'm just wondering if each one of you could point out um, for yourselves, in your opinion, what is the most significant ethical concern with AI right now? Okay, so maybe I'll start, but uh, my, my comment would be highly unconventional, non-mainstream at all. I don't want, uh, so it's not gonna be on ethics of AI, but ethics of AI for people. I'm a business school trained uh, researcher. So um, we just now talked about healthcare. Now, um, just, just to st steal the data generated by Evan, so co-pilot. Um, so what we're d seeing here is, um, so in, in one of the research projects that I, I got involved in, we're looking at how AI can be an enhancer or assistant for radio, you know, radiologists um, who work to detect uh, breast cancer. And we realized, at first we thought, you know, the difficulty, the ethics would be, you know, the data. Where do we get the data, right? And we thought, you know, if we can make sure that the data is is secure and also the algorithm ethics. So if the algorithm, even if it's very hard to explain them, them right now, especially when you're using neural networks, but then let's try to make the algorithm or the decisions based on algorithm as explainable as possible. We thought you know, these are the ethical concerns. But then as we went on our study, we realized that there's another ethical concern that is those radiologists are not happy about this technology. No matter how you frame it, you can frame it as an enhancer, an assistant to them. You can, the first thing you tell them is, this is not gonna replace your job. 
Okay, this is never going to replace our job. The decision is going to be still made by you. You're just going to use it. It's efficient. It's very fast. In fact, research has shown that if radiologists uh, uh, tap into this kind of AI-based image reading, there might be some significant chances of reducing the necessity of repeated imaging. So there's a lot of health-related benefits, but still, the radiologists, a lot of them are still resisting this. So I think, you know, in a kind of like a unconventional um, point on ethics is we need to also care, care about our approach of deploying AI vis-a-vis -vis people who have jobs, although we would, we would think that the, the worry about losing their job is ungrounded. It's going to be a co-pilot scenario. But still, this, these are serious concerns. And these concerns would be translated into resistance on the ground. So next time you see a radiologist, the, the radiologist may not be that forthcoming with the idea. And then that would have some consequences on the type of treatment that you get. So I think ethically, we, need, we also need to deal with that kind of human aspect of AI deployment as well. Yeah. There are three things I was trying to remember. <laughs> what those three things would be. Uh, the first is, it's, um, these technologies can be 100% confident and 100% wrong, uh, and that's not good. Yeah. So that, that is never good, even for a human, I guess, human being, it's also possible. Uh, but that's what it's uh, showing up in chat GBD. The second thing is reinforcing the existing biases that we have. Uh, for instance, I'll give you an example, um, and I also talked about it uh, with Harold uh, in one of our conversations is um, when, for example, if I wanted to get a liver transplant um, versus um, I, when I put on 100 pounds, uh, would I want to, want to get a liver transplant, that person would get the liver transplant and not me because I get to categorize with like adults and and, and yeah, I don't win that. So they're already existing. Like you can talk about these kind of decisions are already being made in our systems. This is not by an AI, this is human decision making. We decided collectively that this is a policy thing. Um, so, uh, but let's say the policy changes tomorrow, right? Somebody comes up and says, no, 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 this is not good. We should use this other thing. The model has already learned whatever it has learned and continue to do that. So we always tend to think in terms of like uh, protected attributes like race, gender, and, and other things. But it is these things as well. So as policy changes, somebody has to say, hey, the policy like, the has to change, and uh, we, are, we don't know. We shake our heads. Anyway, so the third thing is environmental impact. Um, these models, um, they are trained with compute power that none of us models can even think of. They produce so much carbon emissions that like, it is a huge problem. And um, then the more people use it, the more other companies would have incentives to do this. And yeah, we have to think about that as well. So these are the, this, this I see as the main ethical concerns, yeah. Um, from my side, it's the same as Will's. Um, we have to see the human side of uh, the impact of AI. Um, so for in food industries, like there are people in plants who actually try to find foreign contaminants. And so if we put the system, they kind of lose their jobs. Um, but that's not true. So with this system, we come up with like um, a website. So you go to that website and you take a look at what's happening in the plant. Whenever a system rejects something, uh, that image gets uploaded to the website and you can take a look at whether it was wood or it was metal, what color it was, where it happened, how it happened, when it happened. And now the person who was working on the floor and the floor is really cold it's, it's not a good place to work at. So it's like really cold, it's, it's, um, it's wet, it's smelly, 
and you don't want to work there. But now the same person who is working there gets to sit in a warm, nice office, look at the computer screen, and, and try to figure out, oh, I found this wood piece today. I found the same type of wood piece yesterday at the same time and the day before. So now there is a pattern, and there is something happening at 9 a.m. every morning so that I'm finding these wood pieces here. So let me try to figure out where the source might be. So they get, they get kind of an upgrade um, on their job. But not many people know about this. So like everybody said, you know, AI is never going to replace humans. It's just your job descriptions are going to change. And people don't really understand that. So that education um, is really, really important. You need to let people know that you're not going to lose your job. It's just it's going to change. And change can be scary. Oh, do I get to wrap it up with some things I'm scared of? Uh, okay. I'm going to talk about it in short and medium and long term. Uh, the scariest thing, I think, in the short term is that ChatGPT is turning out to be a good enough therapist for poor people. And, uh, and there are people who are now using it as a conversational tool because they don't have anybody in their life to speak to. And we have seen in elder care that how important it is to have somebody that you can talk to and uh, people's quality of life is really affected by that. And I think what we are going to potentially see is people withdrawing from society itself because they have more companions as AI than they do as human beings. And that we don't seem to have a, a system to counteract that because our we just let people fall through the cracks in that way. So. Fear number one is capitalism. Uh, fear, fear, no, fear number two is that um, these models are built on data. And the more that these models are used, the more data that they're getting. And so even like the surgical tool that trains people is measuring the laparoscopic devices as they're doing it. And at some point, it's going to accelerate in the way that it's easier to build data models that do more things because the, the data is getting captured when it wasn't previously captured because you're now using it mediated through computer systems. And so those computer computer systems are capturing it and uh, and and it it you know it's a it's a positive feedback loop when it comes to worlds like the replacementists and so the the medium term is that corporations are taking those data sets and we don't seem to care about whether or not those are public or not and so the second problem is capitalism and the third problem <laughs> is that we have uh, a fear of this concept of replacementists, which is where we all are fraught with the ethics, is that don't we value each other as humans? And what I think we have kind of realized in the shock of AI is that we don't actually value humans unless they produce something for us. And so when they become producers of value or goods, then we think, okay, well, those people uh, you know, are, are important to me because we live in a capitalist system. And so when they start talking about replacementists, like, for instance, the concept artists or something like that that they're going on, uh, what they're actually making is sort of a, a judgment call of, like, there is this encroachment that's happening, and we don't have a system to allow people who have been replaced to exist and uh, and we have not built that into our society because we have built it completely on uh, putting production of something at the core of a human identity right now. And so we're going to have to figure out different ways to think about that uh, as we evolve as a, as a co-pilot in this world. So that's a fun way to end it. <laughs>
and then that caused some serious problems on site. I, I think one of the, uh, a lot of comments about ethics, really important. I'll let you know that before the pandemic, almost before the pandemic started here in the region, the Senate of Canada holds hearings when they're trying to figure out a difficult issue. So they bring experts in to talk about, you know, what is this about? How do we understand what laws we have to make to sort problems out? So um, they were thinking about automated vehicles. What, are, what, are, well, what laws are we gonna have to put in place with regards to automated vehicles? So usually these Senate hearings take place in Ottawa. So experts have to come to Ottawa to answer questions. But in this case, they came to the University of Waterloo because they wanted to see it in action. They wanted to actually see some of these automated vehicles that we were making on site and talk to the scientists and try to find out a lot of questions about ethics. How do you make decisions in your software programming on which way the car should turn in this situation and in that situation? So I'll say that there's a lot of work in thinking about it but what I see happening is that the tools are developing far faster than the policy makers can absorb the information and think about what policies have to be in place. So it's just the speed at which these tools are being developing that are just hampering everyone and that is a critical problem here. Um, I really, I'm really glad that we ended with a couple of questions on ethics because ethics is really important. We didn't talk about cybersecurity uh, and you know other issues related to security of data, but we hope that we've given you a taste of some elements of AI, fun elements in gaming, as well as serious elements in a whole variety of areas. We really appreciate the fact that. Uh, our Stratford community came out to listen to us. Really appreciate that a lot. Um, and I'd like to just close by getting a really serious round of applause for our excellent panelists once more. So we take feedback so that we can improve things from the quality of the beer to what food we provided to the sorts of talks we provided. So please do, I think that Janet, can you tell everybody how they provide feedback, please? Um, if you can please go to the website that, uh, where you registered for the event and let us know how we can do better. That's really helpful to all of us. And if there are topics that you want to hear about, we'll also take that if you have suggestions for topics for the future. Otherwise, um, enjoy the rest of your evening and thanks again to the panelists. <laughs>